Well, good afternoon, everyone. Nakanitam Manichitawinik. As we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory on the homeland of the Metis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Metis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. My name is Keith Willoughby, and I have the pleasure of being the Dean of the Edwards School of Business, and I want to warmly welcome you, everyone today, to the Edwards School of Business, and especially to the 12th presentation in the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. Please allow me some time to recognize our distinguished guests. Ms. Darla Lindbergh, President and CEO of the Saskatoon Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Gord Hunchak, Associate Vice President of uh, Communications here at the University of Saskatchewan. Also, a wonderful shout out to the faculty and staff here from the Edwards School of Business and to our students who are joining uh, today's presentation. I also want to recognize and welcome our future entrepreneurs and their families, those who have been involved in the Get a Bigger Wagon event. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for sharing your talents and your enthusiasm. We look forward to uh, hearing your stories later. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Gordon and Maureen Haddock. Gordon and Maureen are tremendous, great friends of the Edwards School of Business. Both are alumni of the University of Saskatchewan. Gord graduating with a Bachelor of Commerce degree, and Maureen is a graduate of the College of Education. It has been said that they who give money give much, they who give time give more, but they who give of themselves give all. The Haddocks have truly given of themselves. Besides their treasure and besides their time, they are true entrepreneurs. Having them develop the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series is very fitting. This event began in 2007, and every year since that, we have had the good fortune to hear from a variety of entrepreneurs as they have shared their personal and insightful stories with us. In fact, it's very fitting. I returned mere nanoseconds ago from Vancouver, where our, um, our JDC West business case competition team participated in the JDC West event with 11 other, a total of 12 business schools across Western Canada. Our entrepreneurship team won first place in the JDC competition, so good for them. And Gordon and Maureen, as you told me many times over the years, it is very fitting that in this semester, our entrepreneurship and new venture development course is a core class in our undergraduate curriculum. So we are delighted with that. Please allow me to invite to the microphone Mr. Gord Haddock to come forward and introduce today's special guest, Mr. Dwayne Smith. Gord. Thank you. I was worried he wasn't going to make it and I'd have to introduce myself or something, but uh, <laughs> he didn't fly on that one airline that's always late. I won't mention their names, but uh, AC is their initials. But uh, <laughs> So uh, welcome everybody and it's uh, fantastic to see such a full house and to see so many familiar faces. And there's a few of you I know that have been to all 12 presentations. And so uh, thank you for that. I know you're not going to be disappointed with today's presentation. We have a wonderful speaker, Mr. Dwayne Smith, former owner of JD Ag Tech. As I mentioned, he's unemployed right now. <laughs> uh, and that was the farm implement company that sold Green Machine machines, in case you didn't get that from their name. Plus, in addition to that, is we have the launch of our Get a Bigger Wagon Young Entrepreneur Awards. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised when you see what some of these kids are doing. And uh, I know we were, one of the judges, the young judges who was a student here said, I think I gotta go home and relook at my life after he saw what some of these young people are doing. Now, my first experience with John Deere equipment occurred one very hot summer in the early 60s, riding shotgun on an old John Deere tractor with one of my best buddies, Doug Friend, and we were pulling an equally old packer, and we were pounding down the gumbo on his dad's new sales lot, John Deere sales lot in Rosetown. We didn't have a driver's license yet, and each day, and they, they were hot days, each day that I went out there with Doug and rode shotgun, I had my fingers crossed that 
one day he would let me drive. It never happened. Much to my disappointment and a hurt, I still bear today. <laughs> now my first real business was a beer bottle and pop recycling company, a low-tech startup, granted, uh, which entailed walking with a wagon such as this for miles around town in the ditches, picking up beer bottles and pop bottles, and then selling them to the dray man for a penny apiece. Now this business pales in comparison to our guest speaker's first business, which was in chicken and in eggs. And uh, I'm going to let him tell that story, but I'm hoping he'll answer that time-honored question, what came first, uh, <laughs> and let us into some of those trade secrets I know he's hiding. And for those of you who haven't had time to look at all the grad pictures on the uh, college walls, I think it's important to state that Duane was a U of S 1983 College of Commerce graduate who spent years in these very same lecture halls as you, most likely playing bridge and hearts at the, in the lounge, I would think, and not, maybe not so much in the study hall. But let me just give you a few facts about Duane and JD AgTech. He built JD AgTech, a Saskatchewan company, into the largest privately held John Deere dealership in Canada with a total of nine dealerships. In addition to that, if that wasn't enough, he started his own finance company within the John Deere business so that he could provide loans directly to customers in a timely manner. And I know he's received countless awards, probably too numerous to mention, but in my mind, the greatest recognition he received was the offer to purchase his company by Jimmy Pattison. And Jimmy, Jimmy Pattison is a Saskatchewan-born entrepreneur who is Canada's fourth, large, or fourth wealthiest uh, person in Canada. And his company, the Jim, Jim Pattison Group, does not invest in second best. So the sale of the JT Ag Tech in 2014 speaks volume of the kind of operation you built, Dwayne. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dwayne Smith. Thank you, Gord. I'm actually a little younger than what Gord said. I started commerce in 83, and I'm a grad of 87. So uh, just to correct that. Um, <laughs> but it's a, indeed a pleasure to be here, and you know, when I look at some of the uh, previous speakers uh, that have been up there um, to, to, to follow in some of their footsteps and some of the lessons that they would have communicated to you, I'm, I'm quite humbled, because um, I know quite a few of them uh, that have been up there. Uh, but it has definitely been a great journey, and, and, and I'm very excited to talk about the chicken story, especially for some of the future entrepreneurs that are here, because uh, it'll be um, my lessons... Um, uh, will be geared more towards the other students, uh, but the chicken story is very much geared towards uh, you future entrepreneurs. So, uh, so I'm very excited to uh, to share that one. Uh, it has been over 30 years since I've actually been back uh, on campus here, so I'm I'm excited to to return. And in reality, uh, considering some of the new lessons that uh, all of you are learning here, I could probably uh, very easily sit in your seat and have some of you present up here, and and I would learn lots from you. So I uh, I do respect that. As, uh, as Gord mentioned, um, uh, I, I had a lot of growth at JD Ag Tech. Uh, when I purchased the business in 1995, it was my father and uncle that had the, the store in Swift Current. It was about $15 million in sales. Uh, when I sold it to Jimmy in 2014, uh, we had about $330 million in sales. So uh, we were fortunate that we experienced uh, significant growth during that period of time. We did grow from two locations to uh, nine locations. And we grew from about uh, 16 staff to 205 staff. Uh, so, so we had uh, lots of growth uh, during that period of time. And yes, my bank account also grew a little bit bigger during that time as well. So don't want to forget that because I know some of you focus on that from the entrepreneurial uh, side. 
So I did, uh, in preparing for this, try to say what, what lessons uh, did I learn uh, over this period of time. And so I've, I've summarized it into uh, 12 uh, particular lessons. First one, of course, is the chicken story. And, and this one uh, is, is kind of a crazy one. And it started when I was 12 years old. So I think some of you future entrepreneurs uh, that, are, that are here are in that, uh, that age group. And that was, uh, that was when I started on the farm. And the first part of that lesson was uh, when opportunity knock, knocks, uh, do you listen? My grandfather had that business and, and he wasn't really doing much. He was just kind of supplying uh, eggs to the farm. And then he asked me, would you like to take over? And so uh, I, 12 years old, there was lots of other fun things that I could have done, but I saw an opportunity and I said, absolutely. And, and right away I said his business wasn't big enough because he only had, I don't know, 20 or 30 birds that was providing our farm and a few neighbors and that with, uh, with chickens. And I, uh, the first year I had it, I took it up to 125 laying hens. And um, so I, uh, I increased it uh, uh, quite substantially there. But uh, um, right away I learned that you, you had to be up early and work hard. Uh, again, there was lots of other fun things at 12 that I could do, but I had to collect uh, 10 dozen of eggs uh, every day. I had to carry uh, 50 pounds of water and two pails uh, out to, uh, to my birds every day, and I had to do all that before I caught the bus to school. And so that was a very good lesson that applied to uh, my whole business life. I also realized uh, very early, and maybe I was kind of geeky at this, this age, and I had, had that business from age 12 to, I think it was age uh, 16. And... Um, uh, pardon me, age 18, I had it right to the end of school, but um, uh, you, you had to know your goal, goal posts and your measurements, and, and very early I realized that I needed to start uh, tracking my egg production uh, as a young, ki young kid and try to figure out uh, what was working and what wasn't working with my feed and all these different things in, in the business, and so I was graphing, I learned the importance of setting uh, some income targets, and uh, they were very motivational to me. And it also allowed me to learn uh, what, uh, what worked and didn't work. And, and this is all with chickens and all very young. And, and yet it was a very important lesson. The, uh, the other aspect that I learned as part of this chicken story is you've got to work your trap line. Uh, no matter what else happens in business, you've got to know your customers, you've got to be in front of your customers, you've got to uh, give them a product that they're looking for, and, and that's what I did. I got on the phone, I was asking my parents, you know, who are some of your friends and that that I could call to buy my eggs. Uh, my mom, she didn't have a wagon, but she, every two weeks, she allowed me to load up the eggs, I'd wash them and I'd candle them and, and uh, clean them all up and then I'd load them in the car and she'd drive me around town door to door as I knocked on doors and, and delivered to uh, people that I had lined up to buy the uh, buy the eggs with and so it wasn't a red wagon but it was a I think a Ford 500 or whatever that <laughs> car was um, and then the other aspect that I learned very early is is customer service uh, the the importance of of customer service the importance of, uh, of people skills and ultimately I learned very early that by doing that you can charge more and because uh, they, they could have bought roasting birds when I when I kind of diversified into roasting birds they could have they could have bought them cheaper from the grocery store they could have bought eggs cheaper from the grocery store but I was able to charge a uh, little extra money from the service that I provided and you know there was a quality story that I pitched to them and, and everything and and that boded, boded uh, very well within the John Deere business as well because uh, we weren't the cheapest uh, any of you that come from a farm family deer isn't the cheapest uh, but we also through the through the service that we provided were able to charge a little bit more but you've got to be able to justify that uh, I also learned uh, the importance of expansion as I said I, I moved from laying hens into broilers so you're roasting chicken and uh, that that also taught me very early the importance that gross margin dollars pay the bills because it didn't really add any uh, not too many more expenses to my business but it sure generated a lot more gross margin dollars and that's where uh, at a very young age I was investing in term deposits and that while my other friends didn't have any money but I had term deposits so I was pretty pretty excited about uh, about that but with expansion, I also learned uh, uh, comes some risk because uh, as I got a little bit bigger, I needed to kind of um, make things a little bit simpler for me. And so I, I implemented an automatic watering system in my birds. And one morning before I went to school, I went out and the little float in the automatic watering had stuck overnight. And I had a 125 dead chickens floating in a lot of water. And uh, that was uh, over 25% of my, uh, my production uh, right there. So that was, a, that was a big hit at a very early age. 
age. And luckily, my dad and uncle didn't charge me any, anything for my feed that, that particular year. So that kind of helped me out. I also uh, realized very early that um, you've got to rely on uh, outside resources and experience. Uh, I, some of my chickens got sick, and so I realized the importance of developing a relationship at the um, research station in Swift Current, where I uh, found a great scientist, and he would eviscerate the bird and kind of identify all the problems and say, this is what you needed to do. And it showed me that you can't rely on, on your own uh, experience all the time. You've got to rely on, on uh, others. And uh, so th those were some great lessons from the chicken story. And, um, and, and they really continued uh, into the U of S here. Uh, there was one time where I kind of wanted to be a little entrepreneurial. I, I saw all these students and future business people and, they, and figured they needed new briefcases and leather products. And so I found a supplier and uh, somewhere in China, I don't remember how I got them and that, but I brought all these goods in and I set up a table uh, somewhere up in the one foyer here and I started selling in that. But Dean Brennan at the time didn't think that kind of fit with uh, what the <laughs> campus was designed for. So he, he kicked me out from doing that very, uh, very early. Early. Um, and then I, I also realized before I kind of got into the John Deere business, I worked for a company called uh, Royal Trust and, um, and John Deere during university and Federated Co-op. And I learned very early that a lot of those same skills that I just talked about uh, from, from my chicken story applied in, in, a, in a work environment. And I think that's, uh, that's what you, uh, you can get out of today uh, also, is that entrepreneurship, uh, for many of you, may not necessarily involve a share ownership, uh, but it's very much about your, your ownership of your attitudes and your habits. So, so whether you, you go down a path of entrepreneurship from, from owning your own business, uh, a lot of the, the same skills will apply. In, in a business environment. So lesson number two, uh, that was a real fun lesson and, and for you future entrepreneurs it, uh, it, it related to where your age group was. But uh, lesson number two is, is building your experiences constantly. And this is something that I did you know, before getting into the John Deere cycle, but also uh, as I continued uh, uh, down the path with John Deere, is the importance of a positive mental attitude. Uh, I remember reading early at, at Christmas time at school when I, when I had my chicken business, I'd, I'd read books by uh, W. Clement Stone, it was called The Success System That Never Fails, and other ones by Zig Ziglar and Napoleon Hill, and probably authors that a lot of you haven't heard, but it was very much about developing your, your attitude. And I found that that was a, a real key success in, in, in business and in, in getting people to follow you and, and understanding what your vision was and, and in the leadership that you're trying to uh, provide. Uh, the other thing is time management, especially uh, at, at the early onset where you haven't got a lot of resources, you haven't got as many people around you, you you've got to manage your, your time. So your priority management, uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on intentional actions, uh, focusing on specific results and making sure that your, your goals are written down and that you're executing on them. And I'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, the execution there. But time management is something that, uh, that, that I really focused on uh, early, uh, understood the benefit of that and really had to apply it, especially once you got into the John Deere business where you had that many staff and that many locations and a lot of balls juggling. Uh, extracurricular activities were, were a real important lesson along my journey. Uh, I was involved in uh, high school uh, student councils. I was involved with the Commerce Student Society uh, at, uh, on, on campus here, and, uh, and that was very important as well. I also, for some of my summer jobs during, during university, I, I really focused on quality summer jobs as opposed to the, the dollars, and I realized sometimes you've got to focus on the dollars to be able to pay your, your tuition and everything. But I was fortunate that I really focused on some quality jobs to build a resume, develop some skills, and go from there. And then once, once you're in business, ev even though you own the business and you're controlling the direction, you still have to work on developing yourself. And I participated in a program called the Strategic Coach. And uh, the Strategic Coach uh, was something where I flew down to Toronto every, uh, every quarter, worked with a group of entrepreneurs on, um, on, on again, time management, on goal setting, and, and on very specific results, and also developing the team around you. Uh, so, uh, so that's something that I focused on. And then the, the important thing, and it was interesting that Gord brought this up, is I was very much involved in, in peer groups, and, and they allowed us to really build on our experiences too, and they, and they really were a, a critical success factor. So what these peer groups were is, is we, 
we were in a group of about uh, five other John Deere dealers that weren't competing John Deere dealers that were similar sizes, uh, some bigger, some smaller, and we shared our complete financial information. It was a accountability group as well where we, we um, you know, established goals, areas to improvement. There was some monetary uh, uh, rewards and punishment involved in the group, and that was very critical. And Gordon mentioned Doug Friend, and Doug Friend actually was uh, the, uh, the individual that was our facilitator during this, uh, these groups. And uh, our dealership was one of the very first ones that, uh, that joined on with, uh, with Doug, uh, actually in 1989, before uh, like when my uncle had actually uh, got involved with him a little bit. And we did that right up until the end. And, and that's important that, albeit, you know, every John Deere dealer was, was ultimately our competitor, but we could learn from each other, and, and we did. And coincidentally, one of my former partners is now taking over from Doug and is doing uh, some groups. Uh, Gord Boyd Hoffman is, uh, is doing that now. So interesting to see how that uh, continues on. The uh, third lesson, um, uh, execution versus goals. And um, again, you can have all these goals, you can have all these dreams and all these desires, but if you don't execute on any, anything, then it, it's just fluff. It's just words. It's just uh, ideas in your head. You've got to be able to uh, execute. And again, uh, and I mentioned this in my chicken story, is, is when opportunity knocks, uh, are you listening? And this opportunity came in uh, 1989 uh, when, uh, when my uncle and my father approached me and said uh, they'd like to uh, do some succession planning in the business and would I be uh, interested? And at that time, you know, I had a pretty good job with uh, Frederated Co-op. Uh, we were just uh, married. Uh, we finally had some cash coming in. Life was pretty comfortable, but ultimately, everything that I had desired and planned and kind of dreamed of led up until that time. So it would have been pretty easy to, to uh, stay comfortable with a secure job or listen to the opportunity to knock. And that's what we did and, and ended up uh, moving to, uh, to Swift Current or back to Swift Current from Saskatoon to jump into the business. Because uh, that goal of mine to own my own business would have uh, only happened uh, by executing on, uh, on that decision that, uh, that particular day. And uh, the other thing that I learned in, in, in business too is like with, within the dealership in particular, and, 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 and it was quite a, quite a, quite a lesson uh, that you learned because you ha had some great successes and some failures, is you can have all these business plans uh, that, that you want, and you can have all your Excel spreadsheets and all your graphs and all your PowerPoint presentations and everything, uh, but it's just that. They're pretty. What really, what really matters is that you execute on those and make the results gorgeous. So the business plans are pretty, but results are gorgeous. And, um, and, and we realized that very early. There, there was times where we, f we failed in business, where, where staff wasn't on board, or, or John Deere would get mad at us or something, and that's because we, we had a plan, but we didn't execute on it. Where we were successful is because we executed on it, we delivered it. And uh, that, that was something that was really, really, cre really credible, uh, because we found that our, our staff wouldn't be on board with us if, if we didn't, didn't have that plan and we weren't executing on it, we lost credibility if we didn't execute on those plans, and so it was really critical. Deal structure was, was a really uh, big learning curve for me because um, I had, uh, of course, this commerce training, and um, there was absolutely zero uh, training uh, on putting deals together. So I'm not sure what's, what's uh, in place now. But here I was uh, in, in, in the business. Uh, the intention was to buy it from my, from my father and uncle. But, you know, I had no background, no training in how to do it, how to put it together. And, um, and, and so that's something that I had to, uh, to learn on the fly. And then I, then I realized very early that there's always smart people out there to hire. You don't need to know everything yourself. There's always lots of smart people out, uh, out there to hire. And um, so I worked with actually an individual out of Saskatoon that helped put the deal together, helped walk through the process that was comfortable for, for myself as well as my father and uncle in putting that deal together. And I also remember Jimmy follows that same principle as well because after I sold the business to Jimmy, I ran it for, for a year and we were just talking about some of the changes in place and we were talking about the need for a CFO because I was fulfilling that role still. And, and Jimmy just kind of said, and I apologize, I apologize to any of you that are in finance and that, but he said, CFOs are a dime a dozen. You can hi hire them anytime you want. But he, 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 very, he very much believed that, uh, that you can always hire smart, uh, smart people. 
And again, similar to my chicken story where I had to rely on that scientist, but you really needed to build a team of resources. Uh, lawyers, accountants, advisors, uh, the Doug friend, uh, they, were, they were critical to my whole path. Uh, the, the legal group that I worked with back then, I'm still working with now. Uh, the accountants that my dad and uncle uh, worked with, I fired them and switched to, uh, to, uh, to a new group, and they, they were critical. And again, uh, the Doug Friend uh, group uh, was, was just very critical. So don't, don't think you can do it all yourself. Uh, it, it, was a, it was very successful for, for me to, uh, to rely on others uh, as well. The other thing I learned, and again, I was kind of learning on the fly here, is, uh, you know, and I had, I had no money when I was buying the business from my, uh, from my dad and uncle, and, and I didn't have, uh, have, have the experience in that, but I, I did realize that I had to put the right deal together, otherwise um, it, um, it, it, it wasn't, wasn't going to work long term. And uh, so if, if you can learn negotiating, uh, the importance of deal making, uh, and, and, and not just with maybe the people across the table, but your suppliers, your customers, your staff, your partners, it's really important to understand what those skills are, how you, how you can use them, and how you can work together to make, uh, make a successful deal. And, and um, don't, don't read uh, Donald Trump's uh, Art of Dealing book. You might uh, find some other resources uh, uh, out there. And you can always be creative. Uh, we, we had one deal uh, where we were buying two other um, uh, stores, and it was a uh, multi-million dollar uh, deal that we were acquiring and, and we just weren't tipping this guy over. And it, it, like, we, like we were this close and we just couldn't get him to the finish line and, and just during the, 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 the discussion of negotiating, it came down to there was one thing in, in our proposal where there was something where we hadn't rounded up to an even number of $90. And my partner and I that were at the table kind of looked at each other, reached in our pocket, brought out $90 cash, and that's what closed the deal. <laughs> something as simple as that, but it, it closed the deal and it was a very strategic move to get uh, that particular deal uh, done. Lesson number five is uh, selecting partners is like um, uh, choosing your spouse. Now, my, my wife might uh, have some comments on this one, but uh, business, business divorce is just as exp expensive as painful. Now, my wife and I haven't been through a divorce, and I never, never had to uh, divorce a business partner in that, so I was very uh, fortunate there. Uh, but I was fortunate because uh, I selected very properly with my wife, and, uh, and I selected very properly with uh, all my business partners that we didn't have to, uh, to go through that. But I think why that was is, uh, is because it's very important to not only who you choose, but who you don't choose. And, and there was two particular situations there where, where I was putting my deal together. This was back in 1994 when I was dealing on it, and I had the, the structure together. I had John Deere uh, all approved, and, and I had my partners in place. And all of a sudden, I had one of my, my middle brother came, came along, and he kind of wanted into the action. And my dad and uncle were doing some other family planning and everything, but, but this particular brother wasn't, uh, wasn't involved in, in the business. And, and um, without kind of elaborating on, on anything there, it, 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 it was a complication. And fortunately, my, my father and uncle said, it's your deal, it's your, your decision. And uh, for, for a variety of reasons, I decided uh, uh, not to bring my brother uh, into that particular deal. And, and that, was, that was critical. There, just, there wouldn't have been a cultural fit. It, um, it would have created some other conflicts uh, that introduced in the business uh, for, for others that wouldn't have worked. Now, I'm not saying that you know, family businesses don't work and, and relationships don't work, but in this particular case, that was absolutely the right, uh, the right decision. And um, so, so, so that was an important one. And then there was another one where, where uh, before I got hooked up uh, with, uh, with Boyd as my partner and, and uh, some of the stores in the northern part of the province, we were looking at putting a, a very large deal together with, with two other uh, uh, dealer groups as well. We had um, John Deere approval on it, and, which was significant because it's not easy to get John Deere approval to expand. And, um, and we were set up with me being the CEO at that time, and we had our whole uh, org uh, structure all put together. And then all of a sudden, one of the owners of one of the other dealership groups, who I'm good friends with, and if he was in this uh, room, we'd talk about this, but ended up switching gears, and, and he said, you know, I think uh, I need to be CEO as well, and we should be co-CEOs. And, and that just didn't sit with me. It didn't sit with uh, one of my other future partners. And so we made the decision uh, to end that particular deal over that. And again, I think that was critical because I think that was just a recipe for failure to, uh, to have two co-CEOs in that particular case. And, um, 
And uh, so, so that was an, an important lesson. The other thing that I learned here is, is it's important what you, to, to know what you don't know. In my particular cases, you know, uh, even though I ran a John Deere business for 20 years, I don't know anything about iron. Uh, I'm not an iron man. There's some guys that can tell you the horsepower and how transmissions work and all this sort of stuff. I'm not an iron man. Uh, and I realized very early that, uh, that I needed my partners. Uh, and my very first ones were, were one that was strong in the service department, one that was strong in the parts department, and one that was strong in the sales. And I was strong in the general business side. And it, it was critical that I had identified that early because that, that made a very strong team for us in, in bringing the proper skills uh, to drive the company into the, uh, into the future. And one of those particular partners happened to be a competitor because at the same time that I was buying the, um, the, the, the Swift Current store from my uh, dad and uncle, uh, this other partner owned the Kyle store. And I was in the process of buying it out at the same time as putting the first deal together. And Trevor and I had bumped heads and we were competitors and we beat each other up uh, uh, out in the fields trying to do deals. And, um, uh, and yet uh, I saw the skills that he had and he had decided that, you know, even though he was selling out, he didn't really want to exit the business. And uh, so brought him in and kind of put away, you know, uh, the fact that we beat each other up out in the field. And he, he was my best partner uh, over the years because I learned so much from him. So that was, that was really important. Listening to your gut. Uh, you know, had I not listened to my gut and all of that, you, you could have made a lot of reasons for not selecting those people. So, so that was really important. And then uh, the last point relating to this was um, you've got to reevaluate as you, as you grow. So as we were getting bigger, had one particular partner that, uh, that just wasn't comfortable with the risk and, and, um, and some of the things that was happening. And so we just decided to buy him out. He stayed on with us, but we decided to buy him out because he just wasn't, uh, wasn't fitting with where we were going. Uh, lesson number six, uh, cash is king. Uh, we, we learned that uh, real quick. We needed to know where the cash is, where it was coming from, and uh, where it needs to go. And, and that was something where I was very hands-on uh, as the CEO of the business, where uh, even on holidays, I'd have the check register emailed to me. I'd have uh, general, certain general ledger accounts with all the journal entries uh, emailed to me so I could keep track of that. But, but Again, in the peer group, uh, there, there, there was, at the, at, for, for quite a few years, there wasn't a John Deere dealer that was making as much money as what we were and was generating the cash that we were. And it was all, and, and I'm not bragging, I'm just kind of mentioning those benchmarks or whatever that, that all of this uh, pays off or whatever. And, and it was critical and it allowed for us to uh, continue expanding here. And, and, and by managing that cash, it allowed us to achieve a lot of the metrics that we were able to achieve that ultimately um, allowed us to win the, uh, 2011 Farm Equipment Magazine North American Equipment Dealer of the Year, which if, if you understood what that group is, that's like case dealers and, and New Holland dealers and John Deere dealers, and it's quite a group of, of dealers out there. And uh, so that's, um, uh, that was the best award that uh, um, won there. Uh, lesson number seven, uh, and I'm just going to speed this up to make sure we get to the end, but you've got to learn from your failures. Um, as an entrepreneur, you're always going to have failures of some sort, and uh, so you've got to learn what, uh, what the lessons are. Uh, I had a business uh, before I uh, got into this one, small one. Uh, it was in Saskatoon here. Uh, I had left Royal Trust to start this up. It was kind of a training and development business. But I, I realized there I, I hadn't focused on my priorities properly, which I talked about the importance of that earlier. Uh, I, I wasn't in front of customers as my number one activity. I was worrying about, uh, you know, designing a logo and, and processes and, and a variety of different things, but I wasn't in front of customers. Uh, and, and also when, when times are tough, the importance of attitude again. Uh, so very critical there. Uh, we also did a, a small expansion into a, a little town south of Swift Current called Vanguard. Uh, didn't cost me a lot of a lot of money, but it still costs some money, and I, I don't like losing money. Uh, but uh, some of that expansion was was we kind of got a little too aggressive, as opposed to maybe uh, listen to the market a little bit and understand the market a little bit. So you've got to do your due diligence uh, and that, and yet sometimes uh, you never know till you try as well. Uh, you also have to uh, listen to your major suppliers. We had um, one particular deal where we uh, could have acquired uh, Medicine Hat. 
which was a real strategic uh, location for us, and, and we, we messed up there, and some of it was is, is we kind of thought we were maybe bigger than John Deere. We were carrying one other competitive line that we were the, the top dealer in that competitive line to John Deere in Canada, and we had kind of told John Deere, they wanted us out of it, and they were putting some pressure on, and so we, so we kind of told them that we were out of it when we wanted one more year, and, and, um, and uh, so we, we still continued carrying that one line uh, for that year. We were the top dealer in Canada for that one year, so it was pretty high, uh, hard to hire, uh, 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 hide it from John Deere, and uh, unfortunately, they, they wouldn't grant us permission to buy Medicine Hat because of that, so learned a pretty big lesson uh, as far as know, know your position with uh, some of your partners and your suppliers because uh, that was a strategic error uh, on, uh, on our part. And then the last one was uh, hesitation can be costly. Uh, I was talking about uh, we were putting that very large deal together and uh, when, when one of the other dealers wanted to be this co-CEO and we decided not to go that route, we had the opportunity to buy two of the other, other stores. And at that time, we didn't have uh, our own resources. We were going to have to um, uh, borrow some money and uh, and at that time it was a big deal even looking back it, it would have been a cheap purchase price but we were kind of hesitating hesitating and humming and hawing and trying to get everything right and along came uh, another uh, deer uh, group that had uh, John Deere's approval they had the cash in the bank and we lost the deal and 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 that was because we were being a little too cautious in that so so that's a lesson that you've got to keep in mind uh, there as well um, Communication is also um, uh, critical here, and uh, learned very early with my partners. I, in one of our planning sessions, I threw out on the table what uh, what our vision should be, and and some of the numbers were big and audacious, and 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 they weren't even sure that they were realistic. But ultimately, by by getting that out on the table and communicating that vision. Uh, we found the activities that we needed to do to to expand, and, and it was without communicating that vision. Um, uh, we wouldn't have achieved what we did because we, it would have been too easy to kind of be complacent and stay where we're at. Uh, but then once you do communicate that, it's important that your team knows. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I were to identify areas that we weren't as successful as, as others, it was because we just we didn't communicate uh, properly to our team on, uh, on what it was and help them understand the why. Why are we doing something? Um, because once we did that, then they found, found ways of uh, helping to achieve it. We were able to celebrate victories with them. We were able to reward them. But then we also needed to make sure that we constantly uh, communicated to them. And as I mentioned, uh, if we had some hiccups, it was due to poor communication. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, also, um, you, you've got to love change, uh, I believe, as an entrepreneur. Uh, you've got to be open to change and, and not just for the sake of change, but, but simply to always ask how you can do things better. And, and, and myself and my partners, I think we're, we're, we're excellent at this, that, that we never closed our minds to how things can be better. We always asked that question. We always, put, always pushed the boundaries to try to, uh, to do better there. So I think that's, that's important because it's, it's complacency that's, that's going to kill your business. It's going to kill your customer service. It's going to kill any uh, innovation uh, in, in your business. And uh, we were strong believers that if we weren't moving ahead, then, then we were moving backwards. And uh, ultimately, change really, really is uh, um, an attitude and it's a choice. So I really encourage you to, uh, to keep that in mind. Team management was, a, was another thing that I, that I learned uh, along the way. You can be the best people person uh, that, that you want, but, but it really boils down to you need to hire the right ones, you need to let them make decisions, you need to support them, and you need to give them the tools to, uh, to do their job. And, 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 and that's easy to say, like one of the big challenges for us, and especially in a privately held business, and, and you, you're not sure like what people will think uh, of your success, and you, you, you know, in the back of your head, you think they're gonna be jealous or think all these things. But ultimately, we were, we were having to make the decision, do we share our financial statements right down to the bottom number uh, with, our, with our senior management team? And that, and that was a big, big decision for us because the bottom line number was strong and you know, small community and can we trust people? But once we did that, uh, it was a non-issue. We never had any, any concerns come back to us and they really started taking, uh, taking ownership. And uh, so that's where we needed to give them the, the tools. But then we also had to decide going, going forward, you know, are they on the bus with us or are they off the bus? And, and um, 
and this was a, the, the toughest thing in business. My, my kids always thought, oh, Dad, you're so lucky. You're so, you know, glad, you're so fortunate to have this power that you can fire people. And, um, and it, it's, it's, it's not a power that, uh, uh, that you like having because, albeit it, it might be the absolute right decision, and if somebody isn't on the bus and, and they're creating a conflict in the business, uh, if you can't correct it, you've you got to make the choice to move on. Uh, but th those are the toughest things that I, that I ever did, but you, you, you need to do it. You also need to support uh, staff. Um, I had one situation where I had one customer that, um, uh, Albert uh, was his name, I won't get into his last name, but um, he, um, uh, he was a different, different character, and, and he, he just loses cool at the, at, at the parts, parts counter and that. He'd argue with them, and one day he was kind of spitting at them and kicking them, and, and absolutely ridiculous, and, and the staff kind of didn't know uh, what, to, uh, what to do, and I went down, and I told that customer, I said, you get out of my business, and you never return, and he says, I'm the customer, you can't do that. I says, I can fire any customer that I want, and that was one of the best decisions that I ever did, because the staff, after that, like, just said, hey, he's got my back. And it was critical. And, uh, and, I, and the customer was saying, well, can I not shop here? I says, you cannot shop until you come apologize. And it was a while. He came back two or three months later and came up to my office and apolo to, to apologize. And I says, it's not me you need to apologize to. It's my parts person. And he went down and he did. And we let him come back. But boy, did that give me credibility. And uh, so be prepared to fire your, some of your customers if you need to. Uh, you know, some of the basics, uh, compensation, pay your staff, pay them well, pay them above average. You've got to balance that, of course, but, uh, but look after them. Communication, um, uh, I mentioned lots of that. Make it a, as fun an environment as you, ha you, you could. N this was challenging as we got a little bit bigger because uh, we, we, we used to hold lots of events and barbecues and family functions, and as you got bigger, that, that's, that's tough to kind of get the same, uh, same touch to it. Uh, but it was critical to kind of keep it a family unit, and, and I know that's one of the things that they're struggling with now because we, we hear from some of our formal staff, oh, the business isn't the same anymore, and, uh, and uh, so that, that's a challenge uh, going forward. And then if you can do some prizes, we did lots of promotions at different times with prizes, right down to the person who cleaned our floors to the person who was in the back of the shop that was kind of the 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 the, the go-to guy for all the others and we gave prizes to everybody for for different things that they participated in and uh, and that was critical uh, the last two lessons uh, integrate fast with mergers and acquisitions that was one mistake we made when when we did our very large expansion in 2009 we were kind of a little too soft to to or a little too slow to uh, integrate um, you know systems and cultures and we kind of wanted to support their culture and keep ours and and um, and that that caused a lot of conflicts I think it 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 slowed us down in certain ways um, and then the other thing that I learned and again it, it could be different in any particular business but um, as as individual business owners uh, what I would recommend is is try to separate the role um, to what your management role is as opposed to what your ownership role is like within within our business sometimes they kind of like, like we had four partners and they, they, they'd think everybody is, is equal uh, as a partner and forgetting what your different share ownership is, that, that created some problems. You, you really need to focus on the organizational structure and, and what those functional roles are and, and not have your staff worry about where you're at in, in an ownership level. And, and that was a little confusing, but that was a lesson that I, that I learned uh, there as well. So lesson number, number 12. And um, uh, th th this is a big one here, and it's, it's manage your success as opposed to uh, let it manage you. And uh, we'll see if my wife can stay quiet during uh, this particular <laughs> one here, but um, uh, not, don't, don't get cocky as you go along. Um, you know, we were on a pretty good uh, tra trajectory, and, and, and just to put that in perspective, like when I acquired the business in 1995 and sold it in 2014, I didn't have one year that wasn't better than the previous year. And uh, so pretty easy to get cocky and kind of pat yourself on the back for, uh, for all of that. But, uh, you know, we, we didn't achieve that uh, all by ourselves. Uh, sometimes it's, it was definitely luck and, and uh, uh, I don't want to say it was charm and that. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of good people. It was a staff. Um, partners, uh, spouses uh, were critical uh, in supporting us, and uh, so you got to remember that. Also, as your wealth grows, uh, manage it. Um, 
uh, we were strong believers that we wanted to, to grow the company, build wealth inside the company, but we also wanted to build wealth outside. And, and we kind of learned that from farmers. Farmers are a really kind of bad lot from putting everything back into the farm and not having a lot of personal resources. And, and we saw that from a lot of farms and we wanted to build wealth outside the business as well as inside. We felt that that gave us a little more control of our own life, especially when you're dealing with, with John Deere as much as I love them and I wouldn't choose any other supplier. Uh, they're a very controlling uh, partner to have. Uh, so something to keep, uh, keep in mind. And then know when to fold them. Um, we, we weren't preparing to sell the business, uh, specifically on the day Jimmy came knocking, albeit while we were growing the business and, uh, and while we were planning on the business, we always were trying to prepare it for the eventual day that we, we sold, which I think is really important in any business, that if you run it as if you wanted to sell it the next day, you do a lot of activities right as opposed to r run it the way you need to. Uh, but ultimately, when, when Jimmy came along, then, uh, then you make the decision of uh, analyzing the business and say, if I pass up in this opportunity, then what next? And so that was a decision we made, and, and uh, I feel it was the absolutely right one for us uh, at the time for, for all, the, all the factors. And then now in, in my life, uh, in, in, in my unemployment life, as Gord says, um, uh, be strategic in all that you do. Uh, even though I'm involved in some other business ventures and, and I'm on the Children's Hospital Foundation board, uh, I try to make sure that I'm strategic in all my activities, uh, be it fun activities or whatever. Uh, that's something that I still, uh, still focus on. And Bev, this next one is for you. Because I've gotten heck over the years or whatever. Like, you thank everybody but me. <laughs> and you always have to remember your spouse and your family. Um, uh, they are critical along the path, whether, whether they've got their own career, whether they're in the business with you, or in my particular case, Bev was raised in the family, which took a lot of pressure off of me, and she allowed me to do um, uh, what I wanted to do. And, and um, they're on your team. Uh, they need communication as well. They need acknowledgement as well. And, um, and uh, they're your customers as well, even though in Bev's case, she's probably going to say, you called me a customer? She says, I'm your boss. This is probably what she's going to say. <laughs> and then the very last point as I wrap up uh, my presentation is uh, return and give back. Um, community support is necessary while you're growing. We were big believers in that. Uh, even when we didn't have much money, we did lots of community activities. We put lots of, lots of dollars out in all the communities we were involved in uh, throughout the province. And we did that uh, as we were growing. And um, uh, when we did sell out, uh, then uh, Bev and I, we had made that decision that we wanted to give back as well. Uh, we've done large donation to the Children's Hospital. We do numerous other ones. And I think that's, as an entrepreneur, uh, and, and fortunately uh, uh, one that uh, uh, was successful on a financial side, uh, we feel it's important to, uh, to give back. And just kind of a, a little, little twist from, from a scripture reference there, uh, give to others as, as they have given to you. Uh, uh, our money came from, from customers. Our money came from the staff that worked for, with us in, in, in all these communities. And so that's where we felt it was important to, uh, to give back uh, to them. So, um, so with that, I, I was uh, very fortunate to um, have been rewarded as an entrepreneur. You uh, young people, as future entrepreneurs, you're on a, you're on a great path, and, and I encourage you to continue with that. It's exciting, it's rewarding, it's challenging. You're in control of your own direction. Uh, even if you go the path of, of the corporate world, though, uh, keep a lot of these points in mind because it, uh, it does apply. And um, so I think it's an exciting path, and I thank you for having me here today. Uh, I've got a summary of the, the handouts available. I gave them to uh, Ray Alexen. So through one of your profs or whatever, I think they're going to make them available electronically if you care to download them just to have a reference of, uh, of what these, uh, we, these lessons are. But uh, it's a great path and, and one that uh, I uh, wish you uh, all the best success. And this is just uh, wrapping up with our award that we got of the North American um, uh, Dealership uh, of, of the Year in 2011. So thank you very much and wish all the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Duane. Fantastic. Uh, wisdom, experience, expertise, and vision you've given to uh, current students, to, uh, and in fact, I see former students, former uh, Haddock Speaker Series individuals as well, and uh, also the future students here. We do have time before we do the um, 
the Get a Bigger Wagon Young Entrepreneur Awards, we have time for a few questions and answers. So we'd invite, open the floor to any questions, comments that uh, you might have for Duane at this time. Yes. Tell us about uh, negotiating with Jimmy on the <laughs> sale of the business. Probably your, your biggest negotiation of your life. Tell us what you learned through that person. You know, uh, surprisingly, like some of you that may may know his his story, especially early on when he uh, had his a lot of his uh, car dealership growth, and uh, one of the books that was out there was he always every month fired the the lowest performer, and actually my staff were was quite concerned about that uh, once <laughs> uh, once they heard the deal, but but you heard this the, this image of of a really tough guy, and um, you couldn't have asked for a better experience to to work through a deal and get a very successful win-win deal uh, it wasn't grinding uh, as much as, as, as what I uh, thought it might have been and I guess ultimately because we we weren't on the market to sell so so we are the position we, we can walk away at any point in time and so that gave us a lot of strength I think from there uh, but it was very open-ended he was he was very uh, sincere in his like uh, I flew out to Vancouver to do some of my due diligence and and to talk to some of the presidents of, of his other companies and the one thing Jimmy said uh, like this is who I am and we were in his boardroom and he he laid out the chart of all his companies like from down in the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas and he put everything on the table and so he was very open uh, uh, with us you know of course there you know when it got to uh, you know normalization of earnings and, and negotiating in the multiple I was dealing with his finance guys and that but they they were fair they were never trying to to give it to me or whatever they they were they were trying to justify the numbers and to get the return on equity and the hurdle rate that Jimmy wanted while at the same time giving giving us uh, kind of the number we wanted, so I I was very fortunate there. Um, I, I I I think if if I was selling to John, it would have been a lot tougher. So uh. <laughs> great question, though. Yes. Why do you quit your job to become an entrepreneur? You know that's uh, that, that's a great question. Uh, going going the corporate route uh, can be an exciting path. Uh, uh, I was in the corporate world. I, I enjoyed that environment. I uh, when I was with Federated Quat for for example, uh, I was traveling across Western Canada doing training and development uh, for Quat Retails, um, and and I I looked at that as my own little business within the corporation, and and I found that exciting, and I think that's that's a great path. Uh, but ultimately, I think it boils down to, um, you know, my chicken business. And, and I love doing that. I love going door to door. I loved uh, uh, generating results that, that were as a result of what I was trying to achieve. And uh, there's some risk involved uh, with that. But I just, I, the, the excitement of that. I, also, being a farm kid, you know, that's, uh, that's very entrepreneurial from a farm family. And so I was uh, raised in that. And it was just a personal desire that I had to hang up uh, um, my shingle for the corporate world and go down the path of uh, owning my own business. And, and so I think bo both can be a very successful entrepreneurial path. But for me, uh, I just I wanted to create something on my own and see what I could do with it and where I could take it um, working with others. So great question. Yes. Are there any uh, books that you read while you were going through your entrepreneurial growing stage, I guess you could say, that helped you learn more about yourself or about the business? Yeah, there, there, there's lots that I did. The, like, like, like the very early ones were what I had mentioned right at the start, uh, uh, success, success uh, uh, with the, um, um, uh, the success system that never fail, fails. Um, uh, w. Clement Stone, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill uh, was, it was a great book. Uh, Do It Now by Edwin C. Bliss. These, these are older books or whatever, but they, they were great books uh, uh, for me. Um, uh, Good to Great, who's the author of Good to Great? Um, uh, forget which uh, he's he's got a series of three books uh, uh, they, they they were excellent books um, I can think about that a little bit more I'll leave some business cards up here and because because there definitely were some ones that I, I think were excellent so if you want to reach out to me via email I can follow up with you specifically on that so 
You know, one little thing, uh, and my wife reminded me of this on the, on the chicken story, just to tell you the impact that this makes. Um, when our kids were little and, and you could read bedtime stories to them and that, my wife would always go in and she'd, she'd read uh, the, the books that she would. But then they'd always call daddy in or whatever to tell the chicken story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'd tell them the story right from when I got them as baby chicks and how I had to bring them in and, and dip their beaks in the water so they got their first little bit of water and how I had to have the brooders at a certain temperature and, and to this day the kids still talk about that story and, uh, and so I think in their own right uh, they're entrepreneurs and in fact my one daughter uh, uh, Cassidy um, she, she went to uh, Calgary she made the mistake of going to the business school there as opposed to here <laughs> uh, but uh, similar to, uh, to Gordon Marine uh, one of our friends and numerous others started a, a, a program uh, in, in their business school uh, part of the Fast Pisk pitch competition that uh, Royal Bank um, uh, sponsored as well. Uh, but uh, she had an entrepreneurial flavor and, and so them and, and one of their team uh, were working on this one particular project. They were selected as, as one of the 10 finalists in this fast pitch competition and they ended up winning, uh, which was a $100,000 prize in, in, they got $10,000 cash to, to split between them and then $90,000 in in-kind services from other, uh, uh, other partners around Calgary to work on their, uh, their business project and that. It, it didn't come to fruition in that, but it was great to see that entrepreneurial spirit uh, uh, flourishing in her. Well, one more question. Where did you uh, find the money to, the seed money to get into the internet business? Uh, great, great question because I had none and, uh, and, and that's where it goes back to the, the deal structure uh, was, was, was critical and selecting that outside uh, advisor. Uh, it, it did help that my father and uncle were, were the sellers uh, as well, but they had other family members um, uh, that they had to look after in the deal, so they couldn't uh, just give me a sweet deal at the expense of, of my two brothers, and in my uncle's case, uh, uh, he had uh, four children, and there was one other uncle involved, and he had three children, and so they had to manage that, uh, that properly, and yet I'm saying, how, how do I buy uh, a, a business that was a few million bucks at the time? Uh, we're didn't have any money and like no money uh, but thankfully with this uh, advisor that had brought in from uh, Saskatoon Garnet Morris I'll throw his name out because uh, he was uh, very critical uh, helped facilitate uh, different ideas with my father and uncle and, and simply what we ended up doing is is we did a valuation of the business we did an estate freeze converted everything into uh, preferred shares uh, issued uh, common shares and uh, I bought the common shares for I think it was a hundred dollars um, <laughs> and that was that was that was the cash that I put out I, I had to do some shareholder loans uh, over and above the purchase price which I did borrow uh, for that to inject into the uh, into the business uh, but then we had a, we had a redemption schedule on those preferred shares so that that was that was the hook there so so we had a redemption schedule where we, we were committed to annual payments to uh, to my dad and and my uncles that uh, if we missed those then they 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 got the rights back to all the common shares uh, we did guarantees to John Deere where our uh, house and everything was on the line and uh, but uh, I was very fortunate uh, that that the deal could be structured that way and not it not everybody can do it that way but it it allowed my my dad and my uncle to meet the objectives of what they were trying to do with the rest of their family and it allowed John Deere to be secure in the capitalization of the business for the new owners uh, going ahead uh, and um, and, and just the last point with that deal is, is that same deal was offered to my partners. And, and so, so I think that's important because it, it wasn't a sweet deal, just a sweet deal for me. They, they, they were comfortable that that was a fair market deal for all my partners. And at the time, you know, 93, 94 dealerships weren't, uh, um, weren't a super attractive business. Like my dad and uncle uh, had been trying to exit out of the business for a while and they couldn't find anybody uh, coming to the plate. So that, that also helped put that type of structure together because uh, they weren't having people knock on their door with with a big checkbook. Thank you. Thank you very much.